what is Jetpack? It's in its purest original form. It's a side-on single screen shooter. It's a type of game that's frustratingly addictive, yeah, where you keep on wanting to bury your score, or one simple mistake will get you killed. It was a true sort of arcadey experience. I think that was what it, it wasn't a big adventure. It didn't, it didn't have an end. So my first ever uh, experience of a rare game would have been Jetpack. 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 Surprise, surprise. I remember it being amazing, like arcade-like compared to the other games. A lot of the other games were written in BASIC and this was machine code and it was very fast and fluid. Obviously taped it, didn't buy it, because no one did in those days. <laughs> when all the other games on the Spectrum no, didn't look anywhere near that good, so the pocket money just evaporated instantly. I just remember playing it and feeling that this was a, a, really a step above anything else that I'd seen. And my reaction was extreme joy, life-changing. <laughs> It blew my socks off, it really did. Part of the reason I loved it was because it loaded so quickly. <laughs> and the game was pretty good once you got there. Very colourful as well, because a lot of Spectrum games were quite monochrome. That was the start of my love affair with computer games. It's a really smooth flowing game. You can jump and swoop down the screen. But I found it <laughs> quite hard, but pleasingly so. It was like almost like somebody brought out a new machine. The, the quality of the visuals was that good, and it just felt right. It really probably was the thing, the catalyst that started me on the path to where I ultimately ended up. They felt like a bit slicker and a bit more interesting, a bit more imagination put in some. I just thought, where has this come from? Where has this come from? And it was after that that I started to watch out for every single release that came out from Rare. I thought it was really difficult, but really enjoyable, really immersive. And I love Jetpack, and I still like Jetpack, which is, that's pretty amazing after all these years. So when we just finished Cameo, um, our production director at the time at Rare, Lee Shinneman, uh, came to me and said, we want to do an Xbox Live Arcade game. You can make whatever you like. We were thinking about one of the old Ultimate properties. And at the time I just thought, well, there's only one I can make, I want to remake it, and that's Jetpack. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to do that, and he just went, okay, go make Jetpack. So after Perfect Dark Zero, and we'd fiddled about with some prototypes and bits and pieces, then um, the idea of Jetpack came up. I know I wasn't on it right from the beginning, I've obviously been thinking about it for a little while, but I think the idea was that I'd worked on video games magazines, and there was a sort of a retro connection there. I was asked to do artwork for Jetpack Refueled. Now Jetpack is obviously the first Ultimate Spectrum game, so I was more than happy to do that. We wanted to keep the essence of the original Jetpack, so it was going to be a single screen shooter again, the same collection mechanic, the same progression mechanic, but we wanted to refine it for more modern gamers, obviously make it look better. We had input on everything because it wasn't such a massive release. It was coming out on um, Xbox Live, so it didn't come out in a box or anything in the shops. So we found that everybody left us alone, really, and we were able to do pretty much everything. Jetpack Refueled was just this small team. There was myself, Jens Reistermeyer, uh, doing a lot of the software with me. We got Andy Wilson, who was program managing it. The great art from Will Overton. Great music and sound effects from Steve Burke. And then Pete Hens helped out as well with the design of Jetman. And that was pretty much it. So originally I was approached by Lee Musgrave, who's the studio art director at the time, um, to redesign Jetman, to kind of bring him up to date. So my original brief was to create a more anime-inspired Jetman and bear some of those type of stylizations. So a lot of the original concepts, they kind of have big eyes, wild hair, um, and some kind of very mech-type looking armor. As development continued, we started to push those proportions more in the direction of uh, Jet Force Gemini, the, the, those types of characters. So he's a little bit more kind of um, uh, squat, you know, his hands are a bit bigger, his feet are a bit bigger. We decided we wanted to keep the essence of it 2D, but because everything was 3D, we started doing it in 3D, with 3D assets, but from a 2D perspective. And it just didn't seem to gel. The gameplay was sort of working but something didn't look right. I guess after I'd done like, some of the character treatments for, for uh, Jetman, we were kind of in a happy place where he was, I started doing some work on the rocket ships. We had a new sleek Jetman, so it made sense for his spacecraft to be kind of like really sleek. Again, it was kind of taking some of the design aesthetic and like the armor for, for Jetman and, and drawing that into the rocket ships as well. So less of the conventional up and down, you know, Apollo 13 style of things. Then we changed and we went to 3D graphics rendered into 2D sprites because a few games had done that successfully. Still 
something didn't chime right. It was starting to look better. The effects and things were all there, but it just wasn't right. Also did a lot of work on the kind of like monsters, like the Chipugisaur, which is like this kind of big rhino-like creature that had two legs. Again, it's, you're trying to create things that are quite alien and quite menacing at the same time. So, uh, you know, when you're kind of in those first stages of designing something, you, you kind of just let your mind go wild. It was actually Lee and I were talking about this and he said, I wonder what Will, you know, Will Overton, because he's got that lovely style. I wonder if we make it like a sort of living cartoon. Initially, I thought that would meant, okay, I'd do a bit of sort of maybe packaging artwork or design some characters and things like that. But in the end, it was decided that we would draw everything. He has a very distinctive art style, so we, uh, we decided to go with his kind of hand-drawn, hand-drawn style instead. So the backgrounds would be drawings, all the enemies would be drawings. In fact, everything was drawn except for Jetman, who was a, a little 3D model that was rendered out. So his sprites rendered out, just like sort of Donkey Kong Country style. We put those in, literally within a, a few days, and it was like, straight away, that's it. This is the look, we've got it, we can go into production now. It just looked light years better, it looked so much better. So we, um, so yeah, it was, it was down to him to basically draw out the entire set of uh, characters and levels and platforms and whatnot for the whole game. And really Nick, did everything. I would give him the the graphics for the background and he would create all the different levels out of all the different sort of bits of background I would give him, recolouring this, moving this around. So what Will did was he, he pretty much just took Jetman and stuck googly eyes on him. <laughs> He'd already been designed by the time I'd got on the uh, got onto the team so I didn't actually have any chance to muck about with Jetman although I did originally he just had a, a space helmet on and I sort of put the googly eyes inside the space helmet it was sort of floated about in a black thing. He did a very very polished nice kind of uh, pass on him so it looked great and because he did all the the new enemies for the game as well because he did uh, them in his style there was parity between his version of uh, uh, Jetman and all the all the rest of the characters in the game. All the baddies I, I drew by hand and then um, animated. I did all the animation on them. You know, there was nobody saying, oh, this enemy should look like this, this enemy should look like that. We could just pretty much do what we want. So one of the things that we were doing um, in the prototype stage was we had four players. So as we got the four players on the screen, it was just insanely complicated what was going on. You almost had to just concentrate on your Jetman and nothing else because it was just so busy, there were so many explosions, there were so many characters flying around. It was just like sensory overload and a little bit too much in the end, if we're honest. The way Nick recolors everything and he, it was all done in code. So he would, he would sort of color everything and put on these amazing particle effects on it. I'd come out of being the graphics dev on Cameo where we'd done all the vast seas of trolls on the battlefield and we'd done loads of particle effects. And I'd written most of those effects and was quite proud of them. So we took the software over onto Refueled parallaxing and all this sort of stuff. It really, I was amazed to be honest because I wasn't quite sure how it would come out. We did try to throw as many particles around as we could and being a, on a 360 and being a 2D game, it was, you could fill the screen with them to the point that you couldn't actually see so we had to turn it down. It's just this amazing sort of riot of colour and sort of sound and effects. So with the music there was some interesting developments but an interesting history there I think as well. It needs to sound 8-bit but not 8-bit. Steve started literally trying to make things sound a little 8-bit but with higher production values. Jetpack music by Steve Burke just fantastic, just real sort of like nod to old school, the old school sort of spectrum music, beeps and boops, it's, the, it's what it should have been, didn't need an orchestral soundtrack. It's funny when you listen to some um, that dubstep now, like Skrillex and people like that, there are little bits of sounds in the Jetpack Refuel music that you hear in that kind of music. I found, heard one in the Dead Mouse track the other day, which was funny. Like, yeah, Steve was doing that nearly 10 years ago. 
To Jetpack refueled critically, I think it was received really well. We had some really good reviews. People, everybody who played it seemed to really like it. For the audience we intended it for, which was retro gamers that wanted something new but still retro, it just chimed perfectly. Uh, I remember some of the reviews coming in from things like retro gamers. Uh, it was just reading and going, oh great, we've just got it. Thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to do it. And obviously the, you know, the game looks fantastic. So yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it was a great experience all in all. Refueled was a labour of love. It was everything I wanted it to be. It was the perfect game for me. I don't think I would really personally change anything. If you're a modern gamer, picking up Jetpack Refueled, um, like the Spectrum original, I think, just prepare to die very quickly. Jetpack. Fire in the sky! For more sci-fi insights, try our five things you didn't know about Perfect Dark. And we've got the full playlist of 30 stage themes from the remarkable Rare Replay, which includes a stack of retro classics.